Resistance fighters can't be fussy when it comes to choosing a weapon. When you're reliant on clandestine supply and captured arms, almost anything will do. It will come as no surprise then that you'll encounter quite the variety of weapons on the enemy front. The smallest arms on offer are the handguns. Generally only used in secondary roles or as a backup to a rifle, they are nonetheless better than nothing. The Americans have the classic Colt M1911, a 45 caliber hunk of steel that still remains popular a century after its introduction. Designed by the legendary John Browning, the short recoil swinging link design can be found in many contemporary semi-automatic pistols. The similarly iconic German Luger P08 can be credited with the introduction of the 9mm Parabellum cartridge. An outlandish and somewhat costly design, the Luger was officially replaced in service by the Walther P38 before the start of World War II. But the Luger remained a popular sidearm and desirable war trophy. The Mauser C96 is an unusual early semi-automatic pistol that dates to the days of the German Empire. It was known as the broom handle due to its rounded wooden grip, but the absence of a detachable magazine is perhaps its most notable feature. Instead, the 10 rounds internal supply is replenished via stripper clip. Not quite as convenient as an interchangeable magazine, but an effective enough solution for the era. Perhaps most interesting of the handguns on offer is the British Well Rod. Its unusual appearance due to an integrated suppressor and less than conventional mode of operation. Designed to be as close to silent as possible, with a bolt action keeping the chamber sealed until manual operation. This meant that the weapon was exceedingly quiet, ideal for assassination and covert operations. Shotguns are generally associated with police and civilian use, but they do occasionally find function within a military role. The trench gun is a pump-action shotgun made by Winchester, also known as the Model 1897. It proved its worth in the trenches of World War I and reprised its close-range sweeper role in limited use during the Second World War, as automatic weapons somewhat displaced the shotgun's role. Indeed, submachine guns were the close-range weapons of choice in World War II, with their automatic fire making them much better suited to urban combat. Few sounds are as terrifying as the chatter of the German MP40, an efficient yet effective design, originally used by paratroopers and squad leaders, but becoming increasingly desirable in the later stages of the war. Supplies were limited, however, despite the weapon being relatively easy to manufacture due to its all stamped sheet metal construction. The British Sten gun shares this trait, with its simple design requiring little machining, nor any difficult to find materials. Chambered in the same calibre as the MP40, the weapon could even take German 9mm magazines, helping bolster supplies through captured salvage. Most notably, the Mark II S variant depicted in-game comes equipped with an integral suppressor, greatly quieting the weapon, although sustained fire will heat up the weapon rapidly. The canvas handguard serves to protect the user in such cases. The Polish Lightning SMG is similar to the Sten, again designed for ease of manufacture and its ability to use enemy magazines. Known as the Bieskowica in Polish, it was covertly mass-produced in occupied Europe to arm the Polish resistance, proving instrumental during the Warsaw Uprising. The Russians were also present on the Eastern Front, and the PPSH-41, or the Papa Shah, was their SMG of choice, alongside the later, cheaper PPS. Unlike the slower-firing MP40, Sten and Bieskowica, the Papa Shah boasted a tremendous rate of fire – 900 rounds per minute. This earned it a nickname – the Burp Gun, for its furious report and its deadly effectiveness in close quarters. Its drum magazine held an impressive 71 rounds, granting great staying power despite the occasional feed issue. The American Thompson SMG is also known for its ability to spew lead from a drum magazine, but in a military setting only box magazines were used. Lower capacity, but much more reliable in service. 
the hard-hitting 45 ACP round, an ample capacity for automatic fire, and the weapon was a firm favourite amongst soldier, law enforcement, and criminal alike. Automatic rifles bridged the gap between SMGs and traditional bolt-action battle rifles, and the introduction of intermediate cartridges saw the emergence of the assault rifle. One of the earliest such assault rifles was the Nazi Stamgewehr 44, firing a new Kurtz cartridge, somewhere between the power of a rifle and SMG. This meant the weapon could fire full auto without being too difficult to handle, and the increase in firepower over SMGs meant a greater effective range without diminished performance. While the Sturmgewehr service ended with the fall of the Third Reich, similar weapons such as the Soviet AK-47 would go on to become definitive infantry weapons of the 20th century. The Fallschirm Jägergewehr 42, or FG-42, was another automatic rifle, developed specifically to fill the needs of German paratroopers. Unlike the Sturmgewehr, it fires a full-power rifle cartridge, drawing from a side-fed 20-round detachable magazine. While it only ever saw limited service, the weapon would influence later light machine gun designs, with the American M60 taking some influence during its development. The Maschinengewehr 42 was Nazi Germany's general-purpose machine gun, alongside the earlier MG34, providing the ability to lay down sustained fire from a defensive emplacement. It is perhaps best known for its terrifying level of output. At around 1,200 rounds per minute of unrelenting fire, it became known as Hitler's buzzsaw. The Poles had their own homegrown automatic rifle in the Zor 28, a Polish-made version of the American Browning automatic rifle. It was a powerful weapon, firing a full rifle cartridge at a rate far beyond typical battle rifles of the era. Its detachable magazine did limit ready firepower between reloads, however, with only 20 rounds on tap. Despite great advancements in small arms during the war, most regular infantry would be equipped with rifles. Accurate, powerful, and already available in great supply. The Carabiner 98K was the Nazis' primary service rifle throughout the war, with over 14 million produced during its lifetime. Its design is based on the earlier Gewehr 98, in service from 1898 until the shortened K variant replaced it in 1935. It suffers in close quarters due to its slower rate of fire, but when used from a covered position as part of a squad, the powerful Mauser round is effective out to 500 meters with iron sights, or up to a kilometer with a telescopic sight attached. The Gewehr 43 was a semi-automatic rifle of the same caliber, an attempt to improve potential fire output without compromising a rifleman's power. To this end, it was successful, although the reduced recoil and select fire of the Sturmgewehr eventually found greater favor. The G43's gas system took influence from the Soviet SVT-40, an earlier semi-automatic rifle fielded by the Russians. It displaced the bolt-action Mosin gun, although the Soviet's ability to manufacture the newer rifles waxed and waned under wartime stresses. The Americans had a semi-automatic battle rifle at their disposal quite some time before the war, the M1 Garand entered service in 1936. Its most recognizable feature is the absence of a detachable magazine. Instead, rounds are inserted in an on-block clip into a fixed eight-round internal magazine. Upon expenditure of these rounds, the weapon would automatically eject the clip with an audible ping, alerting the user to their need for a reload. One of the more exotic weapons you'll encounter is the British Delisle Carbine. The action is based on a Lee Enfield rifle that the carbine boasted an integral sound suppressor and was chambered for a subsonic 45 ACP round. This meant that the weapon was very quiet indeed, and much like the Wellrod pistol, the noisiest part of its operation was not the shot, but the manual cycling of the action. The Polish Zor 35 anti-tank rifle is perhaps less subtle. A high-powered bolt-action design intended to pierce through early tank armor. Although based on a standard rifle action, the cartridge fired carried a much greater charge, vastly increasing muzzle velocity and allowing the bullet to punch through thick armor. 
Unfortunately, advances in tank designs meant that such armor-piercing rifles became obsolete. And so, arms designers turned to a more explosive means of dispatching tracked vehicles instead. Unbridled detonation is a potent destructive force. Anything can be reduced to smoldering rubble with the application of enough TNT. However, there are more efficient means of delivery, and even a relatively small charge can deal huge damage when its force is focused. The single-use Panzerfaust gave Nazi soldiers the means to tackle armoured opposition. And rather than rely on the projectile's kinetic energy, the warhead uses a shaped charge to punch through armour more efficiently. The explosive is shaped into a hollow inverse cone, and lined with ductile copper. Upon detonation, the explosive force is directed onto a single point, and the resultant jet of molten metal is capable of surprising penetration. The American bazooka was similar in effect, although more capable against thicker armour and able to reach targets further away. Its more durable construction also meant that it was reusable, but much heavier and more expensive as a result. For resistance fighters, these advanced anti-tank weapons were not as commonly available, and so improvised arms such as the Molotov cocktail were the best available tools for disabling enemy vehicles. Little more than a combustible fluid in a frangible container, the resultant deflagration wasn't effective against armour, but could choke engine intakes, emit blinding smoke, and effectively disable the vehicle. Finally, another handheld explosive option is the Nazi steel hand granata, the long handle giving the grenade a distinctive appearance, as well as providing a lever to aid long-distance throws. A pull cord initiates a five-second fuse, and after such a time, the main charge would detonate, ruining the day of anyone caught within the blast radius. This covers most of the arms you'll encounter in enemy front. A mix of some classic World War II weapons, with some interesting, rare and exotic choices. In a time when even regular forces had strained supplies, it's no wonder resistance partisans readily adopted whatever resources were at hand. Thanks for watching, and until next time, farewell.